Thank you, Noreen. Once upon a time, in a far-off land, a beautiful baby princess was born. And as she lay in her cradle, she was surrounded by fairy godmothers, all bestowing wishes. However, one of the fairy godmothers was a wicked fairy. And she bestowed upon the little princess the following curse. That when the little girl became 16, she would prick her finger on a spindle and die. However, all the wishes were not complete. There was yet one more fairy godmother, and she was able not to reverse the wicked fairy, but to modify. And she said that when the little princess became 16, she would prick her finger on a spindle, but she would fall asleep for a hundred years, and she would only be awakened by the kiss of true love. And indeed, when a hundred years passed, a brave and noble prince thrashed through the briars that had grown around the castle and came and kissed the princess. That is not only the folk tale, Briar Rose, and the fairy tale, Sleeping Beauty. It is also what D.H. Lawrence said was the core of every novel he wrote with the exception of Sons and Lovers. <laughs> now, to further the fairy tale and bring it further to D.H. Lawrence, we must understand that that is a Freudian fairy tale. <laughs> and that D.H. Lawrence knew very well that this is a story of erotic renewal. This is a story of understanding latent female sexuality, passivity, and it being aroused by true love and true sensuality. Now Freud's had posited the Oedipal theory and he had deposited the ego and the id. But no one had taken those theories and dramatized them in fiction the way D.H. Lawrence did. It was a first. And Lawrence was very clear and very aware that this was what he was doing. He felt that his exploration of sexuality and gender differences was really about a form of liberation for all people, a liberation from shame, and later I will talk about liberation from social demarcations and other ways of people separating one from another. So this is what was very much the core of Lawrence's passion and ambition. David Herbert Lawrence, known as Bert. I can't get past that, but he was. <laughs> and here's genius for you folks. He lived 44 years. 13 novels, 10 collections of short stories, nine plays, 800 poems. Now we'll get back to that, but they, those were very mixed quality. Travel books, translations, mostly from the Italian, and many letters. One of the things that Lawrence believed, uh, back to Sleeping Beauty as a Freudian fairy tale, is that the idea often socially would be that a woman of the higher classes would be reborn through love and often through a renegade of the lower classes. He called this the democracy of touch. I like that. And this is one of his other great themes. We begin this evening both with the renewal of a, of a passive woman, and we also see the democracy of touch in the first excerpt that will be read to you by 
one of the great voices of the theater, my partner in crime tonight, Brian Murray. Thank you. I, uh, I'm awfully glad to be here. It's a, it's a, it's a miracle to discover this place. Uh, it's like a marvelous oasis in the middle of everything. I want to thank you for letting me come, and I want to thank Susan particularly for, uh, for introducing me to the poetry of D.H. Lawrence, which I really didn't know. It's woefully ignorant. Uh, the Virgin and the Gypsy, bearing out precisely what she was just talking about. It's towards the end of the book, the novella, and uh, uh, Lucille has, Yvette, I mean, has met this gypsy, which is in England a kind of almost an erotic theme of its own. And uh, she has, she's conscious of him, but nothing's happened. The sun was yellowing to decline. What a pity. Oh, what a pity the sunny day was going and she would have to turn indoors to those hateful rooms and granny. As she looked uneasily round, she heard across the running of the water the sharp noise of a horse and cart rattling on the road hidden in the larch trees. The gardener was looking up too. She heard somebody shouting and looked round. Down the path, through the large trees, the gypsy was bounding. The gardener, away beyond, was also running. Simultaneously, she became aware of a great roar, which, before she could move, accumulated to a vast, deafening snarl. The gypsy was gesticulating. She looked around behind her, to her horror and amazement. Round the bend of the river, she saw a shaggy, tawny, wave front of water advancing like a wall of lions. The roaring sound wiped out everything. She was powerless, too amazed and wonderstruck. She wanted to see it. Before she could think twice, it was near, a roaring cliff of water. She almost fainted with horror. She heard the scream of the gypsy and looked round to see him bounding upon her, his black eyes starting out of his head. Run! He screamed, seizing her arm. And in the instant, the first wave was washing her feet from under her, swirling in the insane noise, which suddenly, for some reason, seemed like stillness. With a devouring flood over the garden, the horrible mowing of water. There was one grass-banked terrace of the garden near the path around the house. The gypsy clawed his way up to the terrace to the dry level of the path, dragging her after him and sprang with her past the windows to the porch steps. Before they got there, a new great surge of water came mowing, mowing trees down even, and mowed them down too. Yvette felt herself gone in an agonizing mill race of icy water, swirled with only the fearful grip of the gypsy's hand on her wrist. They were both down and gone. She felt a dull but stunning bruise somewhere. Then he pulled her up. He was up, screaming forth water, clinging to the stem of a great wisteria that grew against the wall, crushed against the wall by the water. Her head was above water. He held her arm till it seemed dislocated, but she could not get her footing. With a ghastly sickness like a dream, she struggled and struggled and could not get her feet. Only his hand was locked on her wrist. Get to the steps, he screamed. It was only just round the corner, four strides. She looked at him, she could not go. His eyes glared on her like a tiger's and he pushed her from him. She clung to the wall and the water seemed to abate a little. Round the corner she staggered, but staggering reeled and was pitched up against the cornice of the balustrade of the porch steps, the man after her. They got to the steps when another Roar was heard amid the roar, and the wall of the house shook. <coughs> Up heaved the water round their legs again, and the gypsy had opened the hall door. In they poured, with the water, reeling to the stairs. And as they did so, they saw the short but strange bulk of Granny emerge in the hall, 
away down from the dining room door. She had her hands lifted and clawing as the first water swirled around her legs and her coffin-like mouth was opened in a hoarse scream. Yvette was blind to everything but the stairs. It was not until she was on the landing, dripping and shuddering, till she could not stand erect, clinging to the banisters while the house shook and the water raved below, that she was aware of the sodden gypsy in paroxysms of cough, coughiness, coughing at the head of the stairs, his cap gone, his black hair over his eyes, peering between his washed down hair at the sickening heave of water below in the hall. Yvette, fainting, looked to and saw Granny bob up like a strange float, her face purple, her blind blue eyes bolting, spume hissing from her mouth. One old purple hand clawed at a banister rail and held for a moment, showing the glint of a wedding ring. With a low thud like thunder, the house was struck again and shuddered, and a strange cracking, rattling, spitting noise began. Up heaved the water like a sea. The hand was gone. All sign of everything was gone, but up heaving water. Yvette turned in blind, unconscious frenzy, staggering like a wet cat to the upper staircase and climbed swiftly. It was not until she was at the door of her room that she stopped, paralyzed by the sound of a sickening, tearing crash while the house swayed. The house is coming down, yelled the green white face of the gypsy in her face. In here, in here, it's all right. They entered her room, which had a narrow fireplace. It was a back room with two windows, and one on each side of the great chimney flue. The gypsy, coughing bitterly and trembling in every limb, went to the window to look out. Below, between the house and the steep rise of the hill, was a wild mill race of water, rushing with refuse. The gypsy coughed and coughed and gazed down blankly. Tree after tree went down, mown by the water, which must have been ten feet deep. A fearful tearing noise tore the house. Then there was a deep, watery explosion. Something had gone down some part of the house. The four heaved and wavered beneath them. For some moments, both were suspended, stupefied. Then he roused. Not good enough, not good enough. This will stand. This year will stand. See that chimney like a tower? Yes, all right, all right. You take your clothes off and go to bed. You'll die of the cold. It's all right, it's quite all right, she said to him, sitting on a chair and looking up into his face with her white, insane little face, round which the hair was plastered. No, he cried. No, take your things off and I rub you with this towel. I rub myself. If the house falls, then die warm. If it don't fall, then live, not die of pneumonia. <laughs>